Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Isaiah Diesel at RG Podcast. And I have maybe is going to be the most interesting conversation that we've had today. I got a very special guest today, Claire Call. Is that right? Yes. yes, that's right. My name is Claire Call. And you are calling out of, from your accent, I'm going to narrow it down to two places. One is Australia or to some part of the UK. You, you are right on the second. I, I am based in the UK. Okay. I, I love your guys' accents over there. And can you, can you tell me where about uh, in the UK? England? Uh, England, yes. Okay. Yes. The southeast. Have you, you lived there your whole life? Uh, no, no. I, I was born in Malaysia, but I have lived in the UK for over half my life. So you're ethnically uh, Chinese. I'm ethnically yes. Mexican, but actually I live in South Korea. So I kind of <laughs> ethnically consider my, or socially, I don't know how you want to call it. I kind of consider myself Asian. I feel like I'm more Asian than I am American, that's for sure. But anyway, because I've lived here like 10 years, half of my adult <laughs> life. And yeah, I really enjoy it. So yeah, we got something in common. Before we get started, uh, I would like to just ask you some general questions about yourself, uh, just to kind of break some ice. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. Top three British bands of all time. Fleetwood Mac comes to mind. I, I think a few of them are British. Okay. Um, I like the Stones. Oh. Or maybe that's too old for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that young. Th this is one, and I can't remember the name, but everybody, everybody has heard of it. Oasis? And they're from Manchester. And uh, Oasis. It's Oh, radio. Yes, that's radio. the one. That's the yeah. one. That exactly that's the yeah. one. All right. Uh, what do you prefer, coffee or tea? I I have this habit of making myself a cup of tea and coffee, the same and time. then taking it to the at the same time and drinking it one after the other. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sorry. You know, it's like I, I just can't be bothered. I, I know I'll need more than one cup of of you know tea. I mean, I would like to, you know, two, two mugs of hot liquid. So I, I use tea I've had a, I've had a lot of conversations. No one's ever said that one. So, but I do know the Brits love their, love their, their, their tea. So, uh -huh. okay. All right. Last one. Who is your favorite action star movies? Um, I don't really watch that many of them, but, but Jackie Chan comes Jackie to Chan. mind. Jackie Chan. You got to go for the Chinese. There you go. All right. Well, th th I can't think of any other. I mean, can you think of uh, Buster Keaton? That, that's yeah. maybe too old for you. I kind of thought you were going to go for Daniel Craig because he's, uh, he's representing Britain. Okay. Anyway, so before we get started in this conversation, I was wondering if you could be so kind as to tell me what is your persuasion from one to seven on the docking scale as far as a belief in God, one being you know God exists, um, seven being you don't, you know that God doesn't exist. I'm agnostic, so I guess that would be five, 50, 50. Four, that actually right? that would be a four. Oh, out of eight, did you say? Seven, one through seven. Oh, okay, 3.5 then. I mean, I want to be in the middle, I okay. guess. Okay. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right, got you, all right. So here we go. So that being said, if you could explain to me your position, because I, I got to tell you, I've heard some positions in my life. I've never heard anybody argue what you've argued for. So would you be so kind as to explain that one? Um, I'm basically, I'm, I, okay, I made the point of being right in the middle because I believe, and I think this is generally accepted, that agnosticism is the most respectable, um, the most intellectually respectable position to take, because we already know that the existence of God cannot be proven and can only be deduced through arguments and observations, which will be easily denied by those who wish to deny the existence of God. So, uh, um, to, to, to waste time arguing about whether God exists or not, when we know he will never appear before anyone to conclusively prove his existence is a waste of time. And um, anybody who knows for certain would have already been dead um, and will 
and even if they could come back and tell us, <laughs> um, um, nobody would believe us. Right. So I believe that uh, belief in God is really a moral and political choice. And I think, um, well, I believe that we have a moral imperative to behave as if we believed God exists, mm -hmm. even point. though we doubt his existence. Okay. So that is my position. So a couple of things you said in there that I, I, I would not agree with, but one of them was that we, that we, you said a lot of we's, and whenever you say we's, that is implying that you know what someone else is either thinking or is, has experienced. So there's that one. And then there's two, you said, we don't know that God, or we know that God is not going to reveal himself. And I would say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that premise one. And then two is that there are people such as myself who have had an experience like a divine in intervention with God. And so for me, like I rate myself at a one on that scale because I positively have experienced either God or some force out there that is, it might even be an alien force, but I've experienced stuff that just no explanation is for. So I just do want to put that flag in the sand. But I would like you to explain to me your position as far as Quran, secular Quranism, because I think that's very interesting. I believe that because we have a moral imperative, and it's only my opinion that we have a moral imperative to behave as if we believed that God exists, um, we have to choose, we have to follow the whole narrative and, and um, we would have to, um, it would be rational to worship the most powerful God conceivable, mm -hmm. because why, why would we worship a, you know, a less powerful God when we know of a more powerful God? So th that would be the Abrahamic God who has revealed scripture for humanity after having divided humanity into Jews and Gentiles and he has revealed the Torah for Jews and the Quran for Gentiles. I choose a Quran because it hasn't got 36 capital offenses and it is the one that has the widest possible application. But that being said you yourself are not a Muslim per se? No. So you don't but I think the world would be a better place if people followed established laws that we can all agree on. I'm just I'm just curious to see where you how you jump to the Quran, and then also what I'm interested in exploring is why even um, make any kind of association with the with the religion because. I am a Christian myself, but I think getting the government involved with religion is probably the second worst thing in the in the planet you could do. To be honest, uh, one of the worst things I think you could do is to be is to adopt atheism. So if you agree that we should live our lives as if we do have some kind of moral accountability, we are on the same page there. Okay, M my my issue is is whenever you have, you adopt some kind of spiritual or holy book um, to say that uh, we, we want to apply this or, or live by this uh, as far as society, that has a lot of baggage with it, you know? There's a lot of baggage. So mm, for example- I understand. Yeah, so so I'm a Christian and and let me, let me be very clear on this. I have absolute nothing but love and respect for Muslims. Obviously there's the one percenters who give the whole group a bad name. But I have been into Palestine. Uh, I have been into Moss. I, I spent a week in Palestine. These are the the nicest, most accommodating, gentle people I've ever met in my life. And I've tell you that as a Christian. So I don't have any personal beef with them. We just had a great talk with a Jew and a Muslim. But that being said, there is a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of history. And then there's mm -hmm. just a lot of cultural baggage so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just trying to understand, and I'm not trying to disprove you here. I'm just trying to give you a little pushback and trying to dig a little deeper, right? I, I've said that Judaism is, it, you know, only applies to Jews, and Jews are only 0.1% of the total global population. And, and also there is the problem of it having 36 capital offences, 
so it's quite harsh. Um, and, and so Gentiles are basically left with Christianity or Islam. And I'm saying that, um, I mean, as a lawyer, you, you kind of have to prioritize it your, your sources mm -hmm. so you you know w when you when you look looking for you know legal precedent to support mm -hmm. your client's case you you know obviously you would want um a, a legal decision from the highest court supporting your position rather than from a lowest court so um I, i'm saying you know if god exists and he is a supreme authority mm -hmm. and he has actually taken the trouble to reveal scripture to humanity in the form of the Torah for Jews and the Quran for Gentiles, we have to go for the, you know, the one with the highest authority with a special application to us. And that would be the Quran, because okay. the New Testament is, is not the word of God. The second question is, why why include any of that inside of the, the realms of the government whenever you know a couple of things? One, there's a lot of historical baggage. Two, there is a potential to be abused by it. There's a lot of potential there. So why the need to uh, adopt anything through the government? Well, because if it does, if the government doesn't do it, then it, it would just be, you know, a matter of inwardly agreeing with something, but outwardly doing something else, which I think is the problem in the West today, because I think, you know, a lot of Westerners think they're Christian, but, you know, what do they do that's Christian? Mm -hmm. it, you know, hardly anything. Um, I can't really think of anything. Um, so, so, so that would be the problem, and I think the, the, the problem is that in the law the rule of law is breaking down nobody actually knows what the laws are for and on what you know what what moral basis they are mm -hmm. so so i think that um christianity is actually has been replaced by liberalism a long time ago you know it it's it, it failed and that was replaced by liberalism and now liberalism is failing and mm -hmm. where did liberalism come from it came from the ideas of the french revolution are we sure we want to run our, our civilization on, on the basis of three slogans, which is liberty, equality, and fraternity? Is it enough to run a civilization on a wish list of three? Okay, so first of all, I, I just I, I want to I want to point out something that the French actually helped the United States in the War of Independence. Uh, whenever we were fighting against the king, uh, they provided yeah. some ammunition and other logistical support. Yeah. Not. And ironically, the king was trying to get back uh, England because they had fought, you know, they're constantly England. Yeah, France, there, there, there was always, you know, a, um, a rivalry between the two yeah. nations. Yeah. And so that move, though, wind up tipping over a domino that wind up eventually coming full circle because the people in the French saw the Americans and so, saw that, hey, we don't have to take these orders from the king. We can govern ourselves. So I wind up biting him, him in the butt. So, but I, I, would, I would think that those, the, those principles started uh, in America, one. And it is kind of like a deistic, it is, it is uh, a lot of Christians like to believe that like America was founded on Christian principles, but if you read like some of the founding documents, it, it is not at all clear that they're referring yeah, to- I mean, to five the of the founding fathers were not even Christian. They, right, they right. rejected the Trinity. Right, right, right. They? Unitarians. So the, the, the point being is that it's the, the direct path, I think that you're saying, it, first of all, to the French Revolution, I think it starts first and foremost with America. And then also, it's it's like a rejection of using the the the, the government to prop up a religion. Okay, so so for me, I'm a Christian, but I consider myself a secular humanist. Okay, because I believe that we should affirm that there's a God, and I believe that that should be a cornerstone of our country. So that was like a when the United States added "In God We Trust" uh, in in 1954 to combat the Soviet ideology of godlessness, I think that's an important part. So I, I, I do think that you're on to something. Uh, it's an important part of having a society that is uh, 
it's going to respect life and, and liberty and value. So I, I think you're going on the wrong direction. My issue is you said something about between thinking, um, thinking and doing it. Like you could adopt every last thing that's in the Quran that you want to support. Cause I do think you're onto something there and I want to unpack that a little bit more. But you could adopt everything and not mention a single word about the Quran. So you, you were talking about, you know, the political baggage, you know, of um, the Crusades and the traditional rivalry between Christianity and mm -hmm. Islam. So, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think, you know, it, it, it's time to admit that Christianity has lost the battle. Because my point really is that the American Republic was founded on an Islamic principle. Chapter 2, verse 256 is the basis of the First Amendment, because what it says is, there is no compulsion in belief. Truth stands clear from error. The, there is a White House Quran. It belonged to Thomas Jefferson. He drafted the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, and it subsequently became the First Amendment. So whenever you say Quranism, let's just take the top five that you think would be the most important that would be something to adopt as a society. Let's just start there, okay? Like, what? okay, what are the top three? Let's we'll start at the top three. The one I just mentioned, chapter two, verse 256 of the Quran, which says, there is no compulsion in belief, okay. truth stands clear from error. And, and obviously, if I want people to adopt it, I want them to think that they're going to get the First Amendment that the Americans enjoyed. And I think that would be popular and, and necessary as well to have okay. free speech, to discuss, you know, okay. things without, without being cancelled. Okay, so the, the Quranism, first and foremost, is freedom of speech. So we're there. Uh, no pushback there. Actually, you might get a little pushback from me because I'm probably not as extreme as the social justice warriors who want to cancel er everyone. But <laughs> on the other hand, I do, I definitely do believe that some speech should, if not have, like, I don't, like, I don't believe if you do hate speech, you should go to prison or jail or anything like that. But I definitely do believe that if you are verbally doing stuff or, or online, that you might be, you should be subjected to some kind of fines because you could have the potential to cause uh, a serious uh, damage to someone. Uh, for example, I'll give you a quick example. So Claire, if I were to say like uh, Claire is an axe murder, I wrote a, a, a story that Claire is an axe murder. Don't, don't, be, don't come under defamation and the laws against that. If okay, it's okay. not true that I'm an axe murderer. Right, 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 right. Right, there's that. But then also what I'm talking about specifically is hate speech, which is um, using transphobic or homophobic uh, language online or bullying, things like that. I do believe that there should be some kind of social consequences that might be something as one. But what is minimum. hate speech? You, you see, hate, hate speech, is it, I mean, is it, is it you know, something that you hate that I say? You know, if I say something that, that you hate, is it, is it hate speech? No, 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 no. It's, no, yeah. no, no. No, that's not, no, it's... No, it's and, and the thing is, you know, I, I think there, there already exist laws against inciting crime right, right. and violence against an individual or a group. Mm -hmm. There already are existing laws. So, mm -hmm. and anything beyond that, I mean, anything short of that would be criticism of a group saying, well, I don't like these people because they do blah, 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 or whatever. Yeah. And, and I think, well, okay, you should be able to say that. And then somebody from them and say, well, it's not true that we did blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, and so we get a debate going, not, oh, oh, you're guilty of hate speech because you, you said a word, you know, and, and you're going to be cancelled and your account's going to be deleted because you said that word. You know? Yeah, so that's what I said. I think people take it a bit overboard as far as canceling. I'm not talking about so much canceling, but as far as having some kind of penal, um, punitive damage uh, to people. But that's just a personal thing I have. Not even every like liberal person agrees with me on that issue, but okay. So we're on a good point there. Uh, we're starting off with a good point. Uh, what would be the second one? The second one would be 
a flat rate income tax of 20%. So it, it would come under KUMS, um, K-H-U-M-S. And this is, this is found in the Quran, correct? Um, it is in the Quran, but but there may you know there may be Muslims saying we don't you know we don't apply it like that and and um, but but then secular Quranism is my own interpretation and and, and therefore there I, I expect people to say we don't do it like that. All right, so I would definitely say that you're on to something because the tax code it is very heavily in favor of the the richest or the richer people they're able to apply for, for tax credits and grants and they're able to hide money and short money and not pay the same rate on, for example, capital gains tax. Warren Buffett was saying out of his total amount of money that he has, he actually paid less money than like his secretary because mm -hmm. of the fact that some capital gain taxes uh, aren't like taxes the way like regular income is, which it should be. Right. Yeah, I think you can set it off your capital gains against your capital losses, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so he, even they did something on Trump that he, something like for 10 years, wasn't paying uh, federal taxes because of something like that, uh, something mm -hmm. he was doing. There was manipulating something. But okay, mm -hmm. so we got that one. That's number two. All right, can we go to number three? The banning of usury. We can default on, as individuals and governments, on loans that we crack, uh, we contracted on usurious terms, are provided we've already paid back the principal. Yeah, so this is actually one thing I really like about uh, the Islam is that you, you're not supposed to charge interest, correct? On loans? No, no, you're not. I mean, it doesn't mean that, that, you know, I have to lend you money and you don't pay me anything, but, you know, I can charge you a flat rate fee rather than, right. you know, interest of compounds so okay okay so there, okay that's an interesting one because what i've heard is that <laughs> places like saudi arabia or or other or other uh, mostly islamic countries what they'll do is like okay so let's say let's say i was taking out like a a, a twenty thousand dollar loan um with your bank okay so what they said is okay so we're going to give you the twenty thousand dollar loan but we're going to charge you like five thousand dollars to set it up, so that's pretty much going to cover the ta the taxes that you would have paid, or that the, the yeah. interest you would have paid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, compound interest has a way of, you know, compounding okay. until until the, you know the, the debtor realizes that they can never pay you back, or they'll just right, right, right. Okay, and pass on the debt to the you know the. the um, descendants. Yeah, that's so. great. So we're, I mean, we're like, we're batting 100% for 100% right now. I'm <laughs> interested, considering your icon, I'm interested to see where the rest of this is going to go. But all right, we're on the same page right here. So let's see if we can find anything that might be, uh, might potentially. So I'll just keep carrying, carrying on. Until please, we find please. Until <laughs> <we like. laughs> okay. Great. I thought I was going to instantly disagree with you, but uh, you're, you start off on the good stuff that like, there's no way we're going to disagree with those kind of things. <laughs> okay, keep going. Um, okay, so, so this might be a bit controversial, but I'm saying that this would only work under a one party state. And, and, and then you, you'll go, oh, that's terrible. It's, it's Nazi, it's fascist, it's communist or whatever, because they all have a one party state, right? But, but there's a verse in the Quran that says, do not do not divide your, your religion, and, and this I take to be um, polit your, your, your political ideology into sects, um, rejoicing in your own doctrines, because this is divisive and unnecessarily divisive, and therefore um, you're not to do it. And I, and, and I take it to, you know, I, I'm interpreting it to mean that you, have, you should have a one-party state. Obviously, the people in the party should have a right to criticize policy or the leader um, and their rights should be jealously provide, you know, protected because if they don't have free speech then nobody gets to criticize government policy and that could lead to error and disaster. And, and the, the final thing I want to say about the subject is that George Washington actually disapproved of political parties and um, you, you can read his farewell speech which is read in the Senate every February, and um, I discovered this February that um, George Washington didn't approve of political parties, and, and this made me very happy. 
Okay. So first of all, I have to say that you are absolutely 100% wrong right now. Okay. You ready for it? Go ahead. Because this is not contentious with me. I actually 100% agree with you. Uh, I actually, yeah, I do. Um, so I live in South Korea. Right above us is North Korea. They have one of the most egregious one party systems that could possibly humanly exist. I don't think mm -hmm. you could get, I don't think you could get any worse than what's up above us. Have you ever been? Yeah, I have actually. I've been there twice. I actually, what's I it went, like? Horrible. It is hell on earth. It, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. I, I, I'll send you a video of, of my experience there. But actually, I went there as an atheist, and it really put a big crack in the ceiling for me as far as uh, questioning my atheism and the, the consequences of, of really what I believed. So I didn't become a Christian because of that, but it put a very giant crack in the glass ceiling of my, my atheism. That being said, that's an egregious example, okay? What's happening, what happened in America, where you have two major parties who are fighting against each other, uh, you can totally see how something like January 6th would happen, where you have an insurrection taking place. So I actually 100% agree with you that dividing, uh, dividing things is not good. I mean, obviously, you want to allow for dissension. You want to allow for differing ideas. But I think whenever you divide something into two, you know, you always need some kind of rival to blame other people for. And whenever you do that, it takes away from you pointing inwards and saying, how are we failing? So I think it'd be good. We're going to, we're going to live and we're going to die as a country. Like we're going to stand together and actually strongly favor that. So, um, we're, yeah, we don't have anything, anything disagreements right here. So why don't we just keep going on? I mean, we could talk we could probably talk an entire episode on that topic alone because I do have a ton to say about that. But because yeah. we agree with that, we're on the same page there. Um, there's a lot of nuances, of course, because there's uh -huh. a, a lot of potential to be abused. But yes. yeah, all right, we're good there. You, 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 you like the, it sounds okay in principle to you. Oh, that, no. that's great. No, not, not, even, not even okay in principle. Like I know if you have a, like a socialist country that's actually working for the people and not just the people on the top that is the best system okay mm -hmm. the problem mm -hmm. is with like north korea is you have a couple of thousand people who run the entire country and so they're, they they use the resources they use the power to help themselves and enrich themselves and they neglect lots of people so i i would say that's a safer system that would be a safer system for making your country stronger but of course, you just have to have, you still have to have a Supreme Court. You still have to have senators and elections and all that stuff. It's not like you don't have any of that. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. All that would still be there. Right. Sure. The divisive nature of having a, a fractured society, like the direction America is going right now, this can only survive a couple of more decades. Like, like America's on the brink of collapse right now. Like this just cannot survive mm. anymore. So, mm. all right, we're good. Uh, let's go to five. Okay. Um. It's called the principle of Shura, uh, S-H-U-R-A, and it means consultation. Okay, elaborate. So, and, and, and it basically says, well, consult, you know, you got, you're the governor and then you, you, you ask the people, how, how am I governing? How are you doing? What do you think of our policies? Are they working for you? So, yeah. that, that's, um, I sure. think fair enough yes yeah and i will say this this may exist in principle in america but it's really not it's not really not the case because you just have again people who are power hun power hungry you have lobbyists who the people with power they need to get reelected in order to get reelected you need money and so it's like a it's a and, and he who pays the, the piper calls the tune yeah and that's why you have corporate america who yeah. basically and lobbying is just another word for bribing uh, was okay, lobbying you to bribe you and you know all right well we still we're batting 100 for 100 at this point yeah let's just keep going the, the foundation of any 
stable society would come from stable marriages and okay. stable families. So secular Quranism supports stable marriages and stable families, and, and it would have to abolish no fault divorce. Because you may know that Muslims treat marriage as a contract, and, and, and if all engaged couples were required to agree a marriage contract before they were married, you implicitly abolish no fault divorce because that would be, mean that divorce is a breach of the term of the marriage yeah. contract. Uh -huh. And 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 I think that is fairer because you know something that is such a big deal as your marriage breaks up, you know, it's not enough for, for people to say, oh, you know, it just didn't work out. We grew apart, you know. Um, I needed some space. I need some space okay. to grow. So from what I understand, places like the Philippines also have laws like this where because I know this because my 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 be, the best man in my wedding was married to a Filipino and they couldn't get a divorce but what they could get is they actually wind up getting an annulment to basically say you were never married and I'm trying to think I know there are well, other Catholic aren't they it's, I mean if you get right. an annulment it means you're Catholic Right. Okay. So they're heavily Catholic there. Okay. Okay. So there's that, but okay. Okay. So first of all, I do want to, I, before we even get into this, I do want to say that, uh, guys are guys and it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Jew or Hindu or Christian or priest or Imam, like guys are guys. And we have like our sex drive and our sex yes. drive, like comes above country it become it comes before all reason all rationality mm -hmm. and not just a reality like you could say oh my god that's so that's so that's so bad you said that you're a christian you're saying that to you you know you're saying that to women this is just a reality that we need to accept in life you know the, the, these are um i, I certainly do yeah but, but the whole point of, of marriage is, is that you know you commit to each other at least in theory you know otherwise what what, what would the, be the point of marriage marriage you no, know okay I, i'm not disagreeing with for, i'm not disagreeing with what you're saying i'm just saying when we're talking about these issues we need to talk about this in a very real and frank way you know mm -hmm. because i mean I, I i i have a lot of muslim friends and all of them i shouldn't say all of them almost all of them i know are even have been open about the fact of their they, that they've had pre-marital Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and actually, yeah. this is so bad when I'm going to tell you this because Muslim women come from, like, Saudi Arabia. This is so bad. To actually get, like, it's called vaginoplasty. I believe that's what it's called. Oh, oh, oh to, 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 to put back the hymen. Yes. So she can, she can pretend yes. that she was yes. a virgin on, on her yes. wedding night. Yeah. And I hate to say this, but I have encountered, we won't go into details, I've encountered some Muslim women in my life. And so this is just, um, yeah, this idea that, you know, you, you, we can say, uh, it's okay, we shouldn't have sex before marriage or da 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 da, da X, Y, and Z, but you're going to have people who are trying to get around this in any way possible. Like I've heard. I know, and, and there's a way of getting, um, making sure that um, they, they know what not to do and and my proposal which i think you may find controversial is chapter 20 the the, the punishment proposed in chapter 24 verse 2 which punishes which will treat unmarried parents as sex offenders attracting a penalty of a hundred latches per illegitimate offspring okay you definitely lost me there but i will say this okay I will say this, that I assume that one of the reasons why is because you're trying to say something that may be the biggest societal failure that causes 20 other, 20,000 other problems in society is going to be uh, a, a displaced family unit in some way or another. Fatherless so homes. Children okay. growing up in fatherless okay. homes, right. be becoming the next generation of, of criminals and underachievers and mentally yes. ill yes. people. Absolutely. And interesting, have you ever read the 
the book uh, Freakonomics. I've heard of it, but I haven't yeah. read it. I'm it's an excellent book. I, I highly recommend that book for, for everyone. Uh, it, it's, I mean, in my like epistemology and my way of thinking, there's probably like five books that are like, I would say everybody needs to read. One of them is uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Freakonomics, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And let's see, there's a few other ones that's slipping my mind right now. But, but, but anyway, so in that book, it shows how in Romania, uh, Ceausescu, uh, Nicolae Ceausescu, a communist leader, he was basically forcing women to have children that they didn't want. And like, like literally penalize, kind of like doing the opposite of that, like penalizing them if they weren't having kids. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. But so they were doing that and it wind up causing a whole generation of people who were like uh, criminals and ne'er-do-wells because like people just didn't want those kids. You know, they were, they were, they were, they were just unwanted. So um, in South Korea, okay, in South Korea, this kind of exists already, but it's just, it has more to do with social engineering than anything. It's like the government doesn't need to tell you anything, okay? The government doesn't say, we're going to hit you, we're going to find you. But what, what, what is going to happen, though, is that if you do get pregnant, like, first of all, 97% of the women will just get an abortion right off the top, okay? The other two, two out of the other three will give it up for adoption, give the child up for adoption. And then the one, like one out of 90, one out of the other hundred is going to keep the baby. And so what happens is if you're not married, the child just gets some kind of like, I guess you maybe say like bastard uh, on the title. It's just considered really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they don't do is they do not encourage or subsidize that kind of behavior. Like I think the government mm -hmm. might give you like a hundred dollars a month, some really small amount, but because South Korea has a really low birth rate as it is, the government does want to incentivize that. So the government will, if you have a baby, will give you like $1,000. And I swear, probably for like the first couple of years, they'll pay you like two or $300 a month, literally. So like all the expenses, pretty much all the expenses of your baby are covered by the government because they're that, mm -hmm. they're that mm -hmm. eager to have kids. But the thing is, the point is, is that South Koreans just will not have kids outside of Budlock. And so I do believe that is we're, we're going in the right direction. And even some canings, like, okay, I thought you were going to say death. And I was like, okay, you definitely lost me there. But okay, maybe if we associated some shame, like the mm -hmm. olden days, they used to put people in pillories or the stock. The stocks. Mm -hmm. The stocks. Um, maybe that might be a little bit extreme, but definitely some shaming. Like I think some good old fashioned shaming might actually do some people some good these days. Yeah, it's, it's cheap and free, and people are happy to do it. <laughs> do you remember the case with the, the guy, the guy, Singapore, the American guy went to Singapore, and he was defacing some stuff, and then he wound up getting caned, and Bill Clinton yes. tried to stop it? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, listen to this. All right, I, I live in Asia. It's like their mindset is, like, they wouldn't be able to comprehend what Black Lives Matters is that concept would be insane because if they're like let's say someone get caught as a criminal here and the cop beat him up they'd be like yeah like don't do that again you might get mm. beat up again mm. like for them to think that they would come to the aid of someone who like attacks the cops and then gets shot or choked out or whatever they would mm. be like yeah we need to put that all over tv because yeah. those are just things if you if you allow that kind of behavior to go away it's more than just that single event then that person's going to think, okay, maybe it's okay to spray paint on this wall or to shoplift or X, Y, and Z. It's like, mm -hmm. I like the, the more you tolerate undesirable behavior, the, the more there will be to tolerate. I was actually looking forward to shutting you down, um, <laughs> Claire, but, <laughs> but we're six in. <laughs> and I mean, I can't really say that I disagree. I mean, okay. So I am what you might consider like pro-choice, though mm -hmm. I will say I would like to see abortions completely ended. But I like I don't think outlawing abortions is the problem is the thing that's going to solve the issue. Okay, 
Like, I believe there's other, there's a lot of other things we got to solve that. Such as. Okay, well, first and foremost, okay, well, just, just give you an example, like Korea. Korea is an example. You don't need to, um, you don't need to explain to women, you need to wait to marriage. That's not a conversation you're going to need to have. Like, if, if I were to talk to a Korean woman, women on the street and, and and i would say do you have any children if she does have children she's uh, single no 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 no. okay and she says no okay so, so let me let me rephrase this all right okay so if i were to ask a, okay if, so if i would ask a Korean woman are you married she's gonna she says no and i say do you have do you have any children and she would say like well no because i'm not married or if you just said, do you have any children? That would be her response is, I'm not married. So it's like, you don't need to have that explanation. Like yeah. it's, it's, not being, it's not being dictated to anybody. I guess you can say by the parents, but there's so much shame associated with that. So it's yes. like, 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 for example, here's one, here's one that like, like they just will not have kids before the age of 30. It just, it's unheard of, okay? You just do not have kids before the age of 30. For them, it's like, we're not even going to think about having kids until we have enough to buy a house. And when I mean buy a house, I don't mean put a down payment and have a mortgage. I'm talking about buy the entire house like cash. So this wow. is their way of thinking. Yeah, they have such a different way of thinking than, um, than people in America. And, and, and another, another thing, too, is like they will not leave their family's house until they get married. So that whole mm -hmm. time until they're 29 or 30 or 40... They don't get married till 40, they will stay with their family. I know guys who are 40 years old who still live with it, who still live with their parents. You know, it's just like it's a cultural thing. And that's that takes place in the Bible where it says, for this reason, man should leave their wife. So it's to get married. So I do believe that we're on a good track because if, if you deal with this one issue, it's gonna solve a thousand other issues, you know? Yes. So yes. I'm I'm so glad we agreed on that. Oh. All right. But let's get to something controversial. I want something controversial. <laughs> okay, but 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 I mean I mean keep 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 telling me your problems and then maybe maybe I'll, I can think oh you know this will solve it or or you know whatever. So. Okay, so so far there's nothing you said that like everything right here. I I could do all this and I don't need the Quran. That's my problem. Is that okay? Because because then what you're going to have happen is you're going to have people who want to use it, who want to have like extreme interpretations of things to say, now we got to start whacking off hands or uh, actually stoning people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So for some infractions like uh, adultery, um, they might... Oh. Uh, go ahead. I, I think that, the, I mean, there will always be people who will want to interpret the law in the wrong way, because, you know, to, to get their way, because um, this is what lawyers do, that, that you know, they are, they'd be arguing over a piece of legislation and say, you know, the word means this and it does or doesn't apply to their client or whatever. So, so there will be people who will, for reasons of their own, want to interpret the law in one way or the other. And, and the only solution to that is to have wise, principled, good people who are competent and not corrupt in charge. And, and I think for that, you need a religious system. I, I can, you know, I can see you saying, oh, I, I like it so far, you know, don't spoil it by giving me anything I don't like. But, but the thing is, if you do that, then, then people will say, but but yeah, it's it, you know it's just your opinion. You're you're, you're just choosing your favorite verses in the Quran. But there's a whole bunch of stuff, and we haven't even we haven't even begun to do it, and and you won't get the the results because you're only picking the things that you like. And and I'm afraid over history, um, in the course of history, you know, lots of people have been doing that, and their their civilizations have crashed and burned. And and talking about usually. Um, Hitler, I know, wanted to abolish it. He wanted to abolish usually uh, because he thought, uh, you know, because of, um, I, I don't know, stock market, the, you know, the, the, the Wall Street crash, and he saw that, you know, um, stock market was a kind of uh, online casino, and it, it also right, yeah, the it Germans. Is, it is. 
Yeah, and, and he wanted to ban it. But as soon as he got into power, he thought, well, I want to, you know, fund my imperial wars. And the only way to do it is to find those clever Jewish people who know how to do this thing or, or, or learn their methods of doing it. Because war finance is a form of usury. And he wanted to, you know, to finance his wars. So, um, you know, people can get diverted because they want a certain thing and they say okay well never mind about banning usually then or i'll only pretend to ban usually for ordinary people which he kind of did but but for himself he needed to well you know fund his wars and, and wars are always funded in this way um and and, and um I, 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 okay the next thing i can talk about is is the islamic um perspective that it is like Quranic principles of warfare so um, it, it does say don't uh, uh, only defensive wars are permissible that this is what it says so if everybody followed this principle then there would be no war you know I, I'm going to anticipate um, if you need if you need the Quran that there is as well as about um, exacting the jizya which is a conditional tribute um, which is basically saying to a country that you conquered in war, um, you can become Muslim, or you can pay us the conditional tribute, which you can avoid if you become Muslim. But you, you know, if you don't want to become Muslim, you can pay us the tribute, and you know, we'll we'll you know do something. You know, we'll leave you alone after you pay us your conditional tribute, which you can you know avoid by um, becoming Muslim. So, so explain that to me, because if you are only engaged in defensive wars, then how could you go and uh, how could you conquer someone else? That seems contradictory. Well, well, well I, I think basically the principles of warfare are, are different. If, if you're defending your own country from mm -hmm. invasion, you, you, you just want to do it because you don't want the enemy to invade. But if you are actually invading another country, the psychology is, is much harder because it's like, oh, we have to go all the way there and we have to, you know, um, maybe besiege them and it will be uncomfortable and we need all our supplies and, and, and it's not going to be worth doing if, if it's only a 50-50 chance of doing it. It has to be a bit, you know, at least 75% of success or the whole thing we might as well not bother because it, it's too much like hard work and, and if we, we get it wrong and it blows up in our faces, um, we'll, we'll feel so stupid like having to withdraw from Afghanistan, you know. And, and, and the fall of Saigon and right, you know, right. and, you, know it, it, you know it's not good when when you when you fight a war that you find it very difficult to explain to your people who who are expected to die in it it's like well, right. why are we in Afghanistan you, you can't explain it to them I mean, the ordinary soldier isn't interested in geopolitics and you know so right yeah. and you know yeah you know what the, a lot of people don't really know this, but the the Af Afghanistan, the Afghanistan war back in the 70s was actually one of the one of the breaking factors for the Soviet Union. Soviet Union, yeah. yeah. So we and, tied and the them British up. also were were terribly defeated in it in Victorian times. Yeah, we tied them up for 20 years there, helping out uh, Al Qaeda back then, and actually Osama bin Laden. A lot of that's. That was kind of a weird history that a lot of people didn't really know about that uh, he was actually funded by the CIA. So it, it's interesting, right, those kind of things when you take a look at history. Like, for example, you mentioned Hitler. Well, we actually used the Soviets as allies to fight Hitler. And then immediately after, we got engaged in a Cold War. And then immediately after, or right at the end, right at the end, we actually wind up funding these terrorists. And then these terrorists, we wind up battling them now for the last 20 years. So just crazy the way history can work sometimes, right? Well, imperialism can, you know, be a mess. If, if, yeah. You know, if you don't know how to do it properly. I mean, there is successful imperialism and, and you know, unsuccessful imperialism. And um, I guess the Americans haven't quite got the hang of it. Be be you know, just because... Um, well, I think because it's not officially an empire, you see, because if you talk to ordinary Americans, maybe they don't see themselves as an empire. 
Okay, so I, I'm not going to sit here and defend everything that America's done because I'm Mexican and my ancestors were uh, Native American. So there's a lot of stuff that obviously I have issues with, right? Mm -hmm. But that being said, as far as all of the empires who have ever existed, like if you were to just compare America, like with, let's say, like the Babylonians or the, or obviously someone like Hitler who had an empire, Genghis Khan, all of these empires that come before, America has definitely, at least in principle, tried to spread uh, democracy and freedom in other countries. Now, I know you don't need to tell me about the history. I get it. I, I know I, I'm a history major, so I totally get it. But for example, giving back some of the land for the Indians or Native Americans, even though it's really crappy land out in the middle of nowhere, that's kind of just unheard of in war. You don't win and you don't win areas and say, oh, okay, you know what? We're going to let you have your own special nation here where you can make your own rules and do things like I'm from California. So they can set up casinos and they can have like mm, MMA. reservations. Yeah. They, they can have MMA style fighting mm -hmm. at casinos that we can't go and see anywhere else, you know? So if I want to yeah. go see MMA, I either got to go over to like Las Vegas or I can go to the, one of these reservations. So they're able to, like, I'm not saying it's perfect, but just what other country can you think of before that who says, we've totally conquered you, but you know what? We're going to give you this land over here where you can go ahead and govern yourself. Like, we're not far from perfect, but we're definitely a lot mm -hmm. better from the, from the empires that have came before us. And I think we're definitely are an empire. But, but I, think, I think if I'm going to be honest, I would love to see America start getting adding more uh, territories like for example allowing puerto rico to actually become a state allowing uh guam to become a state adding like maybe like maybe like a dominican republic uh, so starting oh, adding oh, formally more. And, and become what what 53 states or something. 53 yeah yeah take <laughs> I, I would say build the empire by building the empire peacefully not not going in and annexing places like uh like Russia, how they annex Crimea. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about incorporate people, spread out, like just start adding people as much as we can. Like I would, I would love to see Puerto Rico become a state. Uh, I would let my aunts are uh, Puerto Rican. I have a special love for them already, but you know, just because they're kind of like out there in the middle of nowhere, they're kind of just like, oh, are we in, are we out? We can, we can vote for this thing. We can't vote for that thing. We're a territory. It's like, it's a weird, it's a weird situation, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. let's find something controversial because we haven't butted heads at anything. So let's try to find one thing we can disagree about. That'll be fun. That's your cue. Oh, okay. No, no, because I, 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 I'm going to be, you know, keep, I, I will ask you and, and what are, you know, social problems or political problems you have. And, and I'm just going to give you, you know, stuff that I hope you like. I will say that the Christian war just war theory i wouldn't even say it's biblical at all i mean i i virtually none of it is taken from the bible but i would say generally speaking it's pretty good it's a pretty good idea um for example like not killing civilians unfortunately though you get into circumstances like in world war ii where it kind of just you had to kill there was no getting around killing civilians you know there's just um it's an unfortunate reality. It's not something we should do. We should not target civilians. But whenever you have someone who is potentially going to take over the whole world, which is uh, Hitler, there were just situations where we had to strategically bomb civilians. And even with Nagasaki and Hiroshima, those are, in my mind, for, after studying the history, completely justified, even though they were targeting civilians, it actually saved people's more people's lives in the long run because you had you had a people like a samurai culture people who were just not going to give up. They're like, "We'll fight you. You got to kill all of us." And I, I think the background is is a little controversial. I mean, I've heard you know historians who say the, the, the Japanese were trying to surrender, but but you know maybe the Americans weren't listening. Maybe they wanted to try out their nukes. Um, but 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 anyway, I mean, you're you're not 
I mean, there are certain rules of warfare. You're not supposed to destroy trees. You're not supposed to poison wells and, you know, that kind of thing. That That's also in the Quran. And, and also you oh, want yeah. to treat um, prisoners of war decently. Yeah, and, yeah. And not, not, not you know, uh, um, work them to death or, you know, that kind of thing. But, but that's in the Quran. That's good. Okay. I, I thought of something. Um, I don't know your views on prostitution. Do you do you, do you think there should be licensed brothels, or do you think they should be banned altogether? I'm going to preface this by saying, I live in Asia. Uh, it is more culturally accepted here. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very big preface. I before I met Christ had like a prostitution addiction, mm -hmm. which came about in a very bizarre way because I was actually forced into it. I was forced to partake, participate in it. I was actually locked in a room. So it's kind of just happened by accident and chance. And, but that started an addiction. So I have- Locked I, you in. Kind of like some lady off the street. I actually got lost. And she came and was like, oh, yeah, come over here with me. And then took me in a room and, like, literally locked the door. Oh, no. Yeah, it's such a bizarre situation. You go in there. And they have women in wedding dresses, like, sitting on the floor. You know, like, it's so bizarre. It's such a bizarre. It's, I, it's really prevalent. It's, it's very, very prevalent here in South Korea. It's, as I said, it's a socially acceptable. And I'm not sure if this goes into the... Well, I guess it's better to tolerate some of this stuff than like maybe having illegitimate kids. I'm not sure what their line of reasoning is because technically it's illegal. But I mean, I can say it could be very damaging. But on the other hand, is that a better case scenario than to have like illegal prostitution? Then yeah, I would say yes. Like, like Korea's model or Amsterdam or the Netherlands legalizing and making it safe, you know? Yes, for the girls. I would say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I am in favor of that too. And, and the Quran says it's okay. Elaborate on that, please. Well, well it, it says, um, do not force your your slave girls into prostitution if they wish to remain chaste. Well, that's actually not really relevant to as far as whether or not a woman's going to choose to do it herself. Right. Yeah, yeah, but, but but you could argue that that you know if you, you know, if you are in a situation of having slave girls, then if you don't force the the, the, the slave girl and she voluntarily chooses to do it, then it's okay. And and then well, there could be the further argument that that you know that there's this woman who's not a slave girl and she wants to do it, and and you know of course a free woman should have more rights than the slave woman. So so yeah. You know, she's All allowed, right. and therefore, um, that you know, you, you can have licensed brothels in red light districts, therefore, it should be allowed. That's what I'm okay. trying to say. So, uh, I, I will tell you this so, I went into Palestine, I stayed in Moss for like a week, and part of the uh, part of the exercise that they were doing there was like, we actually went to like, I guess, like a pool parlor. Where they were like smoking and drinking and play, they're they're gambling and stuff, and this is in Palestine, mind you, right? Mm -hmm. But one thing that we did not see in there, which you would see in any other pool parlor, but there are no women, so they they're mm -hmm. like, okay, we're gonna take this, like we're gonna try to take this as far as we can, while still like, you know, still following something. I don't know. It's like some taboos are hard to break, but I just. Just because how realist I am as far as guys go, like you could tell a guy, you could tell teenagers, you could scientifically prove this. If you have sex, you're going to die an hour later and you would still, you would be picking up dead teenagers all every weekend. <laughs> That's just yes. the truth. That's the God's yeah. honest truth. And Allah or God or Muhammad or Buddha, whoever created us that way. And you don't, maybe you don't like it. That's not really relevant. You may like, not like that I'm saying that. That's just the truth. It's like whenever you realize that people have betrayed their countries, their families, their political parties, all for this one issue, it's just like, it's a reality. How are it's we important. Deal? It's important. And, and, and that is the thing. It has to be regulated. Yeah. Hmm. But so then why would some Muslim, so then explain to me this. 
why would some god this is so bad <laughs> this is so bad why would some why would some muslim countries <laughs> have imams at the brothels who say we're gonna we're gonna legally marry you and divorce you like on the spot so that you can go and sleep like what's the purpose of that then oh, uh, it, that, that must be iran mustn't it because the the shia the shias are supposed to be more innovative in these matters you know because you know they, they, they just sort of pretend to marry the woman and then have sex with her so it's not a sin and then divorce her immediately afterwards you know so you know they they think their account is is you know in the clear with god but but obviously i mean if you think of the purpose of marriage it's, it's for, for legitimate children so you know um it's just an innovation and and i don't think it should have been allowed because you know it, it, it makes a, a mockery of marriage because you know prostitution is not the same as marriage is it right yeah you know it's just so interesting as you said that it is it, it's the people's justification for trying to do stuff like even take for example <laughs> afghanistan where like the Taliban, they're like, okay, we're going to, if we catch you gays, we're going to kill the gays, but we're going to have sex with young boys. And that's just a part of our culture. And uh, like, deal with it. You know what I mean? Like the, the level of mental gymnastics that people will go through. To well, I mean, the, the Greeks and Romans, I mean, they probably say, well, well, you know, you're okay with the, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. And they did this sort of thing too. So why are you, you know, uh, telling us off? for doing the pe pederasty was a practice of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. Was yeah, it okay, not? first of all, we're talking about something that happened 2000 years ago. So I'm not really interested in comparing like our modern society to what happened 2000 years ago because they did a lot of ridiculous, they also practiced infanticide uh, back then. So I really don't, that's not really fair to do that. I'm just saying, if you're gonna say that we're gonna kill or we're gonna punish homosexuals, but it's okay for us to practice pedophilic homosexuality. Like, I'm just saying, like, you that just goes to show that your, your way of thinking is totally off because... I, I think I can explain how they think because there are these verses okay, that say sorry, please. that nude acts between men are forbidden. Meaning, you know, adult males and adult males cannot have sex. Or it will be a, a sexual offence. So I guess a legal mind would think, well, um, if it's forbidden for an adult male to have sex with another adult male, why not have sex with, what about sex between an adult male and, you know, a non-adult male? Okay, uh, so... I'm not justifying it. I know, I know. That's, that's probably how it came to be that way. Maybe. Right. I'm just right. guessing. I'm only speculating. Well, you know what's interesting is uh, so I, I actually went into Israel to celebrate uh, Hanukkah and the Shabbat. And they have all of these rules that they've added to practicing the Shabbat that like aren't even in the Bible in the first place. But one of the things, for example, is you're not supposed to light a fire. Okay. So they come up with all these creative ways to like outsmart God because what they basically do, and I, I've actually seen it with my own eyes, they will keep a fire going in their house all day long and they'll turn it down to practically nothing. It's just like some little small flame. So when they want to cook, they'll just turn it all the way up and then make their food, okay? Yeah. And I actually had a Muslim, I was sorry, a Jew explain to me that he can't, plug in anything okay like on, on the sabbath so something happened either his maybe okay may, maybe his air conditioner got unplugged somehow maybe, maybe just on accident okay so it's really hot and he couldn't turn it back on but he has some friends who are non-jewish oh shabbat's going and he couldn't ask, he couldn't say like, hey, can you come into my house and turn on this thing? Because then, then he's asking a non-Jewish person. And they have to drop the hint. It's like, oh, oh, God. I'm so, like, oh, I'm so hot. I'm so hot. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm so hot. You know, yeah. or something like that. And, oh, it's and, getting a bit chilly in here. Yeah. So so, and, and we used to host this, this like rabbi who would come in 
he had to come in the night before because he couldn't ride the subway on Shabbat and it was very near to his house. So he would bring in all of these, these things like <laughs> just the level of the level, level of energy they had to go through to actually practice the Shabbat was like a full-time job, man. But anyway, yeah. he would bring over these, like this ice chest stand, all of his beers, and he would bring over beers to our place. Like, it was so weird. Like we're hosting this rabbi and he's bringing in beers to drink on the show. Well, the kosher beers. I don't, I don't know what it was, but I don't know. But, but we're like, we're like, yeah, we're going to go out to get a drink. And he's like, um, all right. He goes, uh, yeah, he goes, I could go out. He goes, but it's Shabbat. So I can't buy anything for myself. So he's like, you guys want to buy me beers? I was like, and, um, I'm not the very restrained from throwing in a Jewish joke right here because he was a cool guy. But it was like very convenient that we had to buy his beers when we went out, you know. So anyway, uh, but it's just it's just finding the level that people will try to go to get around. Like, yeah, a Muslim girl who I met was like, well, we'll do like 95 percent of everything, but we'll we'll just stop like right here. It was so it was so odd to me because I'm like, I think you're totally missing the purpose of like why you have this religion in the first place. It, this is what you're really trying. Like, we shouldn't be doing any of this, you know? But, mm -hmm. I mean, literally, literally, she was she was either from Malaysia or maybe from Malaysia. Maybe from mm -hmm. Malaysia or Singapore. One of those. Mm -hmm. She was very Asian looking, but yes. she, she came in the night before her, her company was arriving. So she booked her ticket the night before. So she could have one night, like in Seoul, to, mm -hmm. to do whatever she wanted. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was so deliberate the way that she did. It was like, okay, you could you could you could tell people from here to Kingdom Come, don't do X, Y, and Z. But people are going to be sneaking around to do stuff. You know what I mean? I realized yeah. that this was what she was willing to do. And then another time in Macau, it's like another Muslim girl I met. She waited till like all of her family like went away to work and like snuck out for this time and. It was just so, it was so weird to see how they were trying to follow things about the Quran or whatever, Islam, but then they're like, okay, but we're still human, so we kind of have these needs, so it's like, be realistic about this, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, but at least, you know, they, in their minds, know what the boundaries are, and, and maybe it, you know, it protects them more than women who don't have these boundaries. Making or, them less likely to become unmarried parents. Okay, so okay, then then we're good there. And I do want to say this: this may be somewhat, maybe the most controversial thing. Uh, actually, I was thinking the Muslims probably don't even mind right now during the uh, coronavirus because they're already wearing the mask anyway. So like, like <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah, big yes. deal. I I do I I generally do like the idea of modesty and and covering oneself because. Just once again, recognizing what people are, it's like, I genuinely believe. And if I did not believe that this was actually protecting the woman, like if I believed it was more geared towards the men, I would say like, get over it, men. But I genuinely believe that that can actually help women. There's this level of modesty and not revealing yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it could be a positive thing, honestly. Uh, I, I agree that, that, you know, all, all these ideas of boundaries are necessary. Um, to protect us. I mean, why have safety rails and fences? It, it's to stop us from, you know, going too far in. I do want to tell you this. I actually thought that you were a troll. Um, I was positive from hearing you that, like, you weren't actually serious. Like, you're like, I'm going to troll people with this, like, either as a like an, like an, like an Islamophobe, either, either you were doing it that way, or you were like an undercover Muslim. Like, I, I thought there's no way you actually believe this. But actually having this conversation with you, I definitely see there's some rhyme and some reason to it. I Great. would not be for this because of the fact that there is so much potential to, to cause conflicts. Like, like, as a Christian, I believe that the worst thing the United States could be doing is mixing the government 
with any kind of religion whatsoever. And that's fine. We can agree to disagree. This is why we have conversations. This is why we respect each other. Because I actually agree with all of this. There's probably nothing in here that I don't agree. Um, the lashings, that might be a little, bit, a little rough, but it's like, hey, if that prevents you from having like people who I know who have like six or seven kids out of wedlock, if you maybe get the hint after the first time, it's like, well, maybe it actually the means better. justify the ends. Yeah. Sorry, the ends justify the means. Yeah, so I've I've thought about this. Like, let's say you catch someone stealing, and like maybe you just check off like the tip of the pinky. So people <laughs> would know, like, okay, you clearly have stolen something. You're out there, like that shame. Because I think whacking off a whole hand, that might be a little bit too extreme, but like maybe like cut off the tip and then next time go up to the knuckle and then maybe last time maybe take it off maybe that might be like one two three because yeah. the truth is though the, the truth is is that the worst thieves as you were talking about are like at the corporate level these guys are mm. the, the worst criminals on the streets couldn't even put a dent into stuff that happens at the corporate level so i would say this needs to get extended to those guys as well because oh, absolutely. those guys those guys do far worse than their average joe blow who's, you know, stealing, stealing uh, cans of paint or doing beer runs, there's a lot worse that happens. I, I, I don't think, um, you know, cut, cutting it off, off the first time you're caught shoplifting is, is how they do it. I mean, I, I think I would, I mean, they would, they would kind of make you pay it back twice over or, you know, you know, three times over, you know, just to make sure that, you know, you, you, you pay the victim of your theft. You know, for the inconvenience mm -hmm. you cause them without necessarily cutting off your hand, and th there might be an argument for saying um, only violent robbers have that sort of treatment. You know, if you if you mug, you you, you know um, you, you're a burglar, or, you, you know home invasion and attacks on people, bank robbers. Um, mm -hmm. There might be an argument, you know, but particularly if they've done it more than you know three. If they've done it three times, you know, three strikes and you're out. That would make sense, right? that's what i've heard as well from a muslim uh, we actually interviewed one of my muslim friends uh, on this channel uh, about six seven months ago he's actually he's actually one of my best friends and and i'll tell you this is probably the last thing that we'll talk about but i mean he and i would go out for some beers and like have a muslim and a muslim and a jew sitting down and treating each other like you know like friends like okay we disagree with this but uh i mean I, I make lots of jokes about pigs and Al Qaeda with him and stuff, and he makes fun of me and like, <laughs> like it doesn't matter. Like we love each other. We don't care that we disagree on this. But um, w what are your thoughts as far as uh, beer or uh, alcohol in general? The Quran is quite nuanced about it because it has one verse that says, "Do not come to prayer so drunk you don't know the meaning of the words." And then there's another verse that says, avoid alcohol altogether. And there's yet another verse that says, the vine is a gift from God. And so it would be rude to refuse it. So I, I would interpret it in, um, uh, interpret it this way. And, and I think in, in a way that is consistent with what laws there are in the West, which is, public drunkenness would be um, a civil offence. So you get fined for being, you know, if you're drunk and disorderly, um, it would still, you know, bars and pubs would still be open. And, and the rule now in the UK is that if you're a publican or, or somebody who, who um, sells alcohol, you're, you're not supposed to sell alcohol to somebody who's already drunk. Right, right. And I think, I think that, that's fair enough. And, and yeah. you know, no public drunkenness. So, uh, so okay, I, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, this would be the last thing we talked about. But one, I'm a former al alcoholic. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I do not drink to drunkenness now, but I actually drink to enjoy the flavor of the beer. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the taste. But as far as mm -hmm. getting blackout drunk, throwing up and fighting and stuff, that, that's a stage of my life I'm very glad it's over. But mm -hmm. I will say this, that 
I mean, I haven't, I haven't tried a lot of drugs. I got to say alcohol is the worst thing I've ever done because alcohol has turned me violent and aggressive. And it's, I, I've driven many times drunk and I could have killed people. And it's one of those things, like, I, it's hard to even imagine why it's the most, like, it's socially acceptable. Like, here in South Korea, they have, like, the high, one of the highest per capita alcoholic consumption rates in the planet, man. And they are, like, they will go through the most extreme lanes to make sure that, like, you cannot get your hands on marijuana here. It is like they put such a big deal on it. But every other corner... There is a there is a a bar, or like a, it's not really like a bar because they really don't have bars in the way that you think of bars. But what they have is like restaurants, like every restaurant. And I swear I'm not exaggerating. Every last restaurant you go to here has like alcohol. So it's like, in fact, it's like it's almost like not even considered drinking because it's like you go out with your friends and like. You, you might go to three or four different restaurants and every time you're just drinking there because you're like socializing. So if you work at like a company, it is just like, if you want to move up in that company, you got to be out drinking with those guys like three or four times a week. And I'm not exaggerating here. It's so socially acceptable and there's so much alcoholism, but it's, it's just, it's just tolerated, you know? And I, I just, it's like, you're talking about marijuana, which is natural, which is actually can help you with a variety of things, the variety of ailments, and then alcohol, which can totally destroys lives. You know, marijuana doesn't really destroy lives in the way alcohol does. But so I'm like, I have a bit of a conflict of interest on this, you know. But, but really, I suppose, you know, if, if you know that you can't drink without getting drunk, then obviously avoid it altogether. And, and you know, and obviously treat it with respect and drink responsibly, which I suppose adults are supposed to, to, to know. And, and then publicans will know not to sell alcohol to people who are already drunk. Yeah, you know, la so last thing I want to say is that like, so when I was in Israel, like I couldn't find alcohol. And I don't know, maybe just because I was in Jerusalem, maybe it's available other places. I didn't see- Tel Aviv is probably okay, I guess. I, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, actually, no, I, yeah, so, so in Tel Aviv, I would definitely, because I now I remember we went out drinking with, with some of the Jews there, but we, I went into Palestine and actually you get it like, you didn't see people out smoking and doing hookah like all over the place there. It's just like every you turn around and someone's smoking, or you turn around, someone's doing a hookah there. And, and, but they were advertising Carl's balls. And I mean, it's just so not what you would expect. Like if you just looked at the media, you would, you would swear that they're, out taking turns like beheading each other like you beheaded me this time i'll behead you next week or are you blowing me up this i'm gonna make a little bomb over here and you would expect that that's what you're seeing there in palestine but it was not anything even close to i was walking around there like like i was they didn't give me the time of day there honestly and, and in in turkey i went there no i mean it's clear i'm american and it's actually kind of cool sometimes because you, you're in another country and people will glance at you because they'll realize you're America or you'll see them pointing or saying something. But there, they could not care. They didn't even give me the time of day. Everyone's just going about their business. Some women are covered up. Some women are wearing mini skirts. Some women aren't, aren't wearing anything at all. There's 50,000 <laughs> bar. Oh yeah, l l listen to this. This is, this is such a true story. We're gonna end off with this, but I, when I went into Turkey, uh, Taken part two was being released. And taken, he goes to Istanbul and uh, Liam Neeson, and he blows up half of Istanbul in that country, right? And his daughters get kidnapped by some terrorists. I was so frightened because this was coming out right as I was going there. But I literally walked into like a gay rights demonstration and it was right in the middle of this very Western area, bars and everything. And, and, and we, this guy took us out later on at night. And he's like, just so you know, you're probably going to get propositioned by some transsexual uh, prostitutes. And he was like, he was really embarrassed. And I thought he was joking to kind of like, like troll us. But lo and behold, we went there later on that night and there's like transsexual, transgender prostitutes in the windows trying to get us to come up. So yeah, these kind of things exist everywhere. And um, 
maybe next time I'll have to have a lot more questions to ask you, but I would like to touch on the LGBT community, uh, LGBTQ plus community next time. I think that's about all I can take for today. That's a <laughs> fascinating conversation. Do you have any last thoughts? I'm delighted at my reception. Um, we, we've had um, a very productive conversation and, and I'm grateful for the, for the way you chose to to approach this because you know it, the, it um how you ask the questions and everything and and, and you know it, it, it gave me an opportunity to present it in in a better way uh, um and you didn't put me on the defensive and i was able to set out my wares so to speak so so the the quality of your questions and the fairness that you you receive them is, is much appreciated isaiah well are you familiar have you gotten a chance to check out any other the podcast of of yours? Um, yeah. I, I saw the the one you had with um, Khalil. Khalil, yeah, uh, Khalil and a Jew, a, a Jew, Jewish man. We actually interviewed that guy four times. So I see. I normally have an atheist co-host with me. Unfortunately, or fortunately, one of my atheist co-hosts lives in the UK and he just had a baby. So God, God speed to him. He's he's taking care of that baby. And, and then another one of my atheist co-hosts are sick, is sick right now. So I'm working on finding another atheist co-host because it's like the I'm way that I'll stick. So I guess, I guess I can stand in this. <laughs> I can do, I can do either, you see. So the way, well, I, I prefer like fierce resistance. And the way that I'll explain it to you is like, if I cover one eye and I'm like, I'm looking around right now, it's like, there's only halfway that I can see. And when I combine this vision it gives me a, a, a better depth perception, right? And it gives me more of a panoramic, panoramic view. So this podcast is called Respect, Humility, and Empathy because we are trying to respect each other by being honest about the humility that we have, that we don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. On my best days, I know 1% of what there is to know. Uh, we're being, as I said, respectful. And we're trying to be empathetic because we're generally trying to see where the other person's coming from. And you'll notice that in, when you get into debates, there's not really a desire to see where the other person's coming from. It's, I want to prove my point. So when you make your points, I'm already thinking, how can I counter this? So that's one thing that we try to avoid. We do like to challenge people's ideas. Don't get me wrong. We don't like coming here and play patty cake, baker's man. You know, you know, you know that game? So this is UK. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Baker's man. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we, we're having a conversation. Right. We're not just waiting, you know, for, for our turn to speak and, and not even dealing with what, you know, what the person now said. I mean, I, I, I've listened to, you know, exchanges like that and it's really boring because there's no connection from one, what, one sentence to another, you know, because some people... You, you know you know when journalists have a list of questions to ask somebody and they don't really care what the answer is you know it's like I'll ask you a question you answer it and I don't care what the answer is and then I move on to the next one and then you answer it and I don't care what how you answer because I never you know have a follow-up question to show that I understood what you said and have right. had a further question so or, or, that's really what I'm trying or to say gotcha questions um, that's one thing we don't do we actually always send the questions in advance. The reason why I didn't send you the questions is because you already thoroughly know what you're talking about. So it was, if I was gonna quiz you on something not related to something that you're so open about, we, we always send the questions in advance because we don't like to ask gotcha questions. We do not permit, under no circumstance, do we permit cross-talking or interrupting. And then we just do not permit attacking people like I, I could say what i think that you said was total bs i could say that but what i wouldn't do is i say you're an idiot for believing that you know like you may have your own you may have experiences that i will never understand you know being a woman growing up uh, uh chinese uh where you are living in two different countries you have the exact different scenario as far as going from asia to the West and I've went from Asia, I've went from the West to Asia. So our thoughts would crisscross in so many different ways. And, and this is the last thought I wanna say, and then I'm closing after this. In, in a former company that I was working for, the manager was Chinese, a Chinese woman. And we bumped heads a lot, probably like 10 times. 
And there was a lot of cultural stuff going on. Uh, for example, I'll just give you one quick example. I used to always bring in like oranges or whatever just for the people. And every time I would offer her one, she would always say no. And I was like, I just felt like she was rejecting me. But when I talked to my boss, she's like, hey, this is like a cultural thing. It's a polite thing for them to refuse. So it's like, maybe you could just leave it on her desk. And I noticed every time I would leave it on her desk, the next morning, like it was gone. So she was clearly eating it. And it was just like a, you know, we were bumping heads. And my daughter was, my daughter was about getting ready to get born. My wife was pregnant and she's, she's Asian. And we went out for one of these kwashiks, which is where you go out and drink. And man, we had about five beers in. I'm starting to get a little buzz. And I started talking to her. I started, was able to open up a lot more with her, you know, because you're drinking, you're not at work, which is why they, they promote this so much in Korea. But I said, you know what? Um, I'm so sorry for the times that we've butted heads. And I said, uh, I'm getting ready to have a half Korean baby. Uh, my wife's Korean. I don't always understand First of all, from male to female, you're never ever going to understand that. It doesn't matter if you're the same race or not, you know. But then you also throw in the cultural baggage as well. Mm -hmm. And I said, I just want to understand you. And I want to be able to understand my wife and my daughter. And then she told me something that, like, I will never forget. I, I, I will, to my dying day, I will never forget this. But she was like, yes, I understand what you're trying to do, Isaiah. She's like, but, like, understand your limitations, Okay. And I was like, I was so offended at the time because I was like, I'm making all this effort. And we wind up getting along really well, like as a result of this thing. But I came to understand what she meant. Like, even if I could 100% understand her, even if I could filter in her being a woman, her being Asian, her, us being at different ages of our lives, I would have to filter that out through so many different levels. And I would never be able to understand what her raw, unfiltered imagination of a situation is in. So I might be able to understand her, but not unfiltered. I would have to filter it through multiple layers. And mm -hmm. so this is just something I've learned from living overseas for 10 years. And so this is why this podcast is, is here for people to talk, to say we're not going to agree on everything. We can agree to disagree, but we can respect each other. And with that being said, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to have to have you back around too. Is that good? I would love to come back. And thank you for um, an engaging conversation where I feel heard and listened to. I'm going to have to bring my an atheist coast. I'm going to have to call for backup. So, because we're we'll probably <laughs> have to get a lot deeper on this. So I'm going to take some notes. I'm going to do a little bit of research. So I, I thought I was going to come in and just like expose you for being like a... a I thought, I thought you were, I genuinely thought you were trolling in some of the conversations I've heard. So I wasn't nearly as prepared as I probably should have been, but this is a good, this is what we say is that we say we're, we're just moving the, this is a American football. I know football is soccer for you, but if you get 10 yards, you get a first down in America. And so uh -huh. you have four plays. And so we're just kind of just constantly trying to move it one step in, one step in, just trying to move the chains so we can get in better, better picture of each other, you know, and respect each other. So thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back again. If you're not subscribed already, please do so. And leave us, I a, am comment. Subscribed. Leave us a comment below if you'd like to see another topic uh, discussed, or if you'd like to come in as a guest, you can check out our website at www.ritpodcast.com. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Spotify, just about anywhere you can find a uh, spot podcast, you can find us. So Thank you for listening, and we look forward to seeing you back again. Goodbye.